Well, good morning and welcome to Central, where we seek transformation through the renewing work of the Lord Jesus. That's what we're all about here at Central, and what that means is we believe that Jesus can change your life. He can change anybody's life. We've been studying the book of Hebrews together, and really what that book is, is it's, it's a sermon letter. It's a, a written down sermon by a pastor to a group of Christians who uh, have a Jewish background, and they were living in Rome at the time, and they were thinking about giving up on Jesus. Their life was hard. They were really struggling, and following Jesus was hard in their day, and they were thinking about giving up because Maybe it was disappointing, it was challenging to live for Christ. Maybe it was even unfulfilling. But the pastor said to them, as he would say to us, don't give up because Jesus is greater. He's greater than anyone or anything that you could possibly live for. So we come to chapter 7 today and we come to a, a technical discussion of the priesthood. And when I read this text, it may sound weird to you. It's going to sound like inside baseball talking about the priesthood because we don't think about the priesthood all that much in our culture. And even less do we have a clue who this Melchizedek character is. He's mentioned twice in the Old Testament. He's mentioned in Genesis chapter 14 and Psalm 110 and that's it. But this pastor makes a huge deal about Melchizedek and we wonder why. What in the world is he talking about? Well, I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you exactly why right now. Because to Christians of a Jewish background, thinking about returning to Judaism, this pastor is saying that old priesthood isn't sufficient. What they had wasn't sufficient to give them a permanent and lasting assurance before the throne of God. If you want a permanent and a lasting assurance that you can be clean before a holy God in heaven, if you want to know that you have a a firm place to stand before the judge of all the earth, what they had wasn't enough. You need something more. You need a greater advocate. You need Jesus. You need a greater advocate who doesn't have any limitations, You need an advocate who is permanent. You need an advocate before the throne who will never cease to be effective, who can represent you before a holy God and will never fail to offer you mercy. If you want a firm place to stand before the throne of God, if you want assurance that you can live in eternity in a new heavens and a new earth where everything wrong has been made right. If you want that, then the only place to find it is in Jesus. That's what this text is about. Cling to him because Jesus is the only place where that can be found. So let's pray and we'll turn to Hebrews 7 and read what the pastor has to say. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit and give us soft hearts, that we would see and behold Jesus as more beautiful and worth everything that we are and everything that we have. Would you help us to seek him and find him today? Help us to believe and trust him and live for him. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? rather than the one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from one which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who becomes a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath, by whom, by, by the one said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our God will stand forever. We all need a priest. Everybody. We all need a priest. Now, wait a minute. You might think we're Protestants here, Pastor. Well, that's true. But the Bible says we all need a priest. And the priest that this text is telling us we need is Jesus. Jesus is our priest. And what he does is verse 25 tells us, He helps us draw near to God, and He makes intercession for us. When the Bible tells us that we need Jesus as our priest, He's talking about Jesus as an advocate. And we know all about what an advocate does. It's something that we encounter in everyday life. Everybody needs something or someone to make some kind of pronouncement, some kind of verdict, some kind of assessment from outside of us to speak a good word over you to make some sort of assessment that that affirms who you are, to speak a good word about your life when there's so much that's so wrong about us. It's so wrong about our world. Everybody wants a good word spoken over them, right? Isn't that true? I think everybody wants that. Everybody wants an advocate in their life. I think it's true spiritually too. It's still true even in our world, even in this generation, that tends to think of God as a holy judge is a repellent idea. There's an idea in our culture that says, I'm free, and nobody can judge me, right? But if you listen carefully to what secular people say, and if you listen to the music we listen to, and if you watch the movies that we, our culture produces, there's a sense that all of us has that recognizes that something's wrong, Something is wrong. Something is off in this world. We feel it. We understand it. We recognize it, that there's something off in the world out there. And we realize that something's off in here too. We sing about it. We make music about it. We make movies about it. I even recognized it with a guy named Tony that I met and went fishing with a few weeks ago. Now, I met this guy, and we were fishing together, and Tony asked me, what do you do for a living? And when people ask me that question, and I say I'm a pastor, most of the time it's like the record gets scratched and the conversation stops. Like, you know, wah, wah, wah. (laughs) Um, But Tony instead started asking me more questions. And when I told him that my ministry started, started out by working for a relief and development organization called Food for the Hungry, and, and I worked for this organization and did ministry in 35 of the poorest countries on the planet, trying to help people think about poverty from a, a spiritual lens, he asked me even more questions. And one question that, that was really interesting to me opened up an avenue to share the gospel with Tony. He asked this question, what are some of the worst things that you've seen in your life? 
been in some of these countries, what's, what are some of the worst things that you've seen? It's an uplifting conversation, right? <laughs> but that began this conversation that really gripped Tony because he, he was intrigued by this idea that there was a God who would take on flesh and enter into this world that is so wrong and want to make it right. He was completely blown away by this idea that, that God would take on flesh as Jesus and enter into this world, that he cared about it enough that he would enter into this world and go to a cross and take the judgment on himself for all the ways that we have made this world wrong, all the ways that we have in sin brought destruction into this world. He was completely blown away that this God would take on flesh and do that and then be raised from the dead because that God wanted to make this world new, wanted to make it right. He was amazed by that idea because... Tony said, I've had some really hard things happen in my life. There's been a lot that's gone wrong in my life. So he started telling me about some of the things that were wrong in his family, some of the hard things that he's faced in his life, some of the things that he tried to do to make it right, and none of it worked. And he started telling me about all the ways that he had tried to silence the voice of all the things that were wrong in his life. He said, I've tried to silence it, he said, through a lot of alcohol. <laughs> that's, such, that's a choice a lot of people make. They try to you self-medicate, to try to silence the voice that says so much is wrong in our world and in my life. Some people try to silence all that's wrong through drugs or through sex. Some people try to silence that voice of all that's wrong through retail therapy. You know, we... We think I'll drink my sorrows away or I'll try to buy my way into feeling better about myself. And if you've tried it, you probably have a sense that it's not going to work. Or it only works for so long. Because it leaves you with this, this gaping hole of despair when you feel, figure out it's not going to last. It leaves you with this huge mess of knowing something is wrong and I keep turning to all the wrong solutions nothing's gonna fix it all these songs are about it all these movies are about it it made me think about the a ballad from that 1980 theological tour de force movie urban cowboy <laughs> starring John Travolta and the great song that came out of it looking for love in all the wrong places it's true what we do we look for love in all the wrong places and it just leads us to that same place over and over and over again we need an advocate that's going to give us a help that lasts we need somebody that's going to give us a help that's permanent to deal with all the wrong and the brokenness and the destruction and the sin that's out there in the world and help me deal with what's wrong inside of me we need an advocate that won't fail we need an advocate who's, who's not going to give up on me. We need an advocate that's going to last forever because everything we try fails in one way or another. And that this text says even the Old Testament Levite priests, they fail too. None of it lasts forever. And the pastor says, that's why you need Jesus. Jesus. Because Jesus is the greater priest. Jesus is the one who's permanent. Jesus is the advocate who heals all the wrong. Jesus is the advocate who's permanent, who will never fail you. Jesus is the advocate you need that has no limitations. He can heal every wrong that you have in your life, and he will never drop you. He will never forsake you. You need a better advocate. You need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Two points to consider this morning from this text. The first one is, why is Jesus our greater advocate? And number two, why is that encouraging to people in St. Louis, Missouri in the 21st century? First, why is Jesus a greater 
advocate. Well, to get there, we have to follow the argument about Melchizedek. So hang on with me for just a moment. Here's a contrast in verse 11 between the priesthood of Levi and the priesthood of Melchizedek. Now, if you remember your Old Testament, and if you don't remember your Old Testament, don't worry. It's okay. There was a promise that God made to Abraham. We studied it last week. That promise made to Abraham is, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. You're going to have more people, more descendants than all the sands on the seashore. And Abraham was given a child, Isaac. It's a child of that promise. And Isaac had a son, Jacob. And Jacob was named, another name, Israel. And he had 12 sons. And one of those sons was Levi. The 12 tribes of Israel, Levi, one of those sons, is the one whom all the priests came from. So all the priests in the house of Israel came from Levi. And what the the pastor says here in verse 18 is that all the priests of Levi were set aside because of their weakness. They didn't work. It didn't last. Why? What weakness? Verse 22 says they were prevented by death from continuing in office. The priesthood couldn't be permanent because they were all human beings. They all died. And also, verse 27, they were all sinners. They had to offer sacrifices for their own sins. So those were the two major problems with that old priesthood of Levi. Their advocacy wasn't permanent. It wouldn't last. It had limitations. And second, it wasn't perfect because they were sinners too. So in short, while Levitical priests did a good job temporarily, they weren't up to the permanent job of representing God's people before a holy and living God forever. He said, so you need a better advocate. You need one who's going to last forever, and you need one who's not a sinner himself. So how's Jesus better? Well, he comes from the order of Melchizedek, verse 11. Now, he comes out of the Old Testament in Genesis 14, and it's like he just comes out of nowhere in Genesis 14. He appears out of nowhere without genealogy. And if you know anything about the early chapters of Genesis, Moses there is obsessed with genealogies. He writes over and over and over, the son of, the son of, the son of, the son of. But Melchizedek has none of that. There's no succession. There's there's no family. None of that. He just comes out of nowhere. He has no genealogy, no lines, no successors. And what what the, the pastor is saying here is Jesus is like that. He doesn't have the limitations of genealogies. He doesn't have the limit limitations of successors. Jesus's priesthood is permanent. It's forever. He says in verse 21. Jesus' priesthood isn't regulated with limitations. It's never going to end. That's how he's compared to Melchizedek. In verse 23 and 24, the Levite priests all died and their priesthoods ended. But Jesus has an indestructible life. He was raised from the dead, verse 16 tells us. So Jesus' priesthood is never going to end. It's, he's never going to get worn out. Jesus is never going to get sick. He's never going to get too old to represent you. He's never going to fail at his job. He's never going to get too frail to ask God for mercy for you. It's amazing to think, but Jesus isn't limited as a human being. So he's never going to say, look, Ned, I've spent enough time on you. I've got other people I need to worry about. I have limited focus here, Ned, and you've taken up too much of my time. I've got to get on to all these other people here. So I've moved. Jesus isn't limited like that. He's a priesthood without limitations. He's a priest who's able to focus on all of his people forever. He's never going to say, I've had enough of you. He's not like all those Levites. He has no limitations of human priests. He can represent all of us perfectly before God all the time. He's always there to be an advocate before God for you. He doesn't have limitations. Second, he's also greater because he's not a sinner. Verse 27 He has no need, like those other priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because Jesus offered himself up. Jesus himself was the lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God who offered himself for our sins. So there is no more sacrifice required for your sin. 
Through Jesus, we have full and perfect, complete access to the holy and living God because we've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. So if you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, there is no longer any barrier between you and God on the throne. His sacrifice was full and complete and perfect. And all of your sin, everything that's wrong in your life has been cleansed and you are justified before the sight of God. There is nothing left to be done other than simply to trust and believe. Jesus is a far superior priest. He's a greater priest. He's a greater advocate than any of the old priesthood. So why is that encouraging? What difference does that make? Why is this not just a great Bible history lesson for them? Why does it make a difference to you in St. Louis today? Well, look at verse 25. It says, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God. That little word, uttermost, is interesting. It's a compound word in the original, in the Greek, and it it joins together the word for complete and ending, or all and end. It puts them together. So what that means is he's saying all the way to the end or down to the completion of the ending. He's able to save all the way down to the end. So what the pastor is saying here is Jesus, your priest, Jesus, your advocate, is able to save you by the blood of the cross. The Lamb of God slain for you is able to save you all the way down to the very last moment of your life. He's able to save you down to the very last moment when you take your final breath and close your eyes for the very last time and then you open them again and you're standing before the throne of God. He's able to save you all the way down to the very end, to the very last moment of your life and you're standing before God. Jesus is able to save you all the way then. There's never a moment in your life There's never a sin in your life. There's never an occasion in your life where Jesus' advocacy is unable to offer cleansing to you. Is that not encouraging to you? I remember being a little kid, and maybe my mind worked weird as a kid, but I remember being a kid and and thinking this, what happens if the very last thing that I do before I die is a sin? And I don't have an opportunity to repent. What happens if if the last thing I do is sinful and I don't get to say, I'm sorry, Lord? Am I lost? What happens if the last thing I do before I close my eyes in death is sinful and then I open them again and I'm I'm standing before Jesus and I've got sin on my hands? What, What happens then? What this verse says is nothing other than that sin being covered by the blood of Christ because Jesus, the Lamb of God, is able to save to the uttermost, to save down to the very end, down to the last moment. He's able to, all the way to the end, the blood of Jesus covers you from beginning to end, from top to bottom, from first to last. Jesus' blood is sufficient. There is no moment in your life, if you trusted Jesus, there's no oops moment. Oh, I forgot to cover that sin. There's no blip outside of his care. There's no moment when Jesus will fail to represent you. There's no piece of your life where Jesus says, oh, that's a bad one. That one's above my pay grade. There's never a, there's never a moment like that. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost, all the way down to the end, if you've trusted Christ There's nothing that you have done. There's nothing that you will ever do that Jesus' blood is unable to cleanse you from it. That's terrific news. That incredible news. I'm sure you've probably thought about that moment when you stand before the throne. At least I'm guessing you've thought about it to some degree, that that moment at the end. I, I can remember thinking about 
out about it like standing before a bench in the courtroom and the Lord calls your name. Donald Clay Smith II. I swallow hard and stand and Jesus is there as my advocate and I remember thinking about him like maybe a frazzled public defender. He's got way too many cases in this one day and and he's like something like, Father, well, um, this one's a doozy. Uh, this is a tough case because this, this kid, he, he's guilty. Oh, boy, he is really guilty. But um, would you forgive him again? Uh, yeah, he's, he's done this a lot. Um, but uh, uh, he's probably going to do it again. But would you forgive him? I mean, just for my sake, would you forgive him? Just... Just this, please. Is that how it goes in your mind? It's not anything like the picture of what the scriptures teach. Nothing. The circumstance is much more like Jesus, our advocate, standing before a holy God, and he says something like, Father, we demand perfection. We have a righteous perfection, and he's not. Our justice demands that his life is forfeit. He's condemned because he's a sinner and perfect justice demands that he forfeit his life. But Father, look at my nail-pierced hands. Look at my side. Remember that we together said the Lamb of God sacrificed for all of my guilty children that my blood would be enough. He's condemned, he's guilty, and yet holy and perfect justice and wrath has been poured out on me. Look at my wounds, Father, and let's remember that we together said that I died, that all the guilty children would be set free. I've died that he might live. Father, remember that this is, this is an act of justice. I was condemned. Justice has been poured out on me that Donald Clay Smith II is set free by mercy. And it would be wrong. It would be unjust for two to give their life for the same condemnation. I gave my life that he would be set free. That's what the Bible teaches 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus pleads his wounds that we might be forgiven and set free. And it's to the delight of our heavenly father, as the hymn writer says, justice smiles and asks no more is Jesus gave his life. Jesus doesn't plead with some ill-disposed father, but rather the son expresses the, the father's will to love us and save us to the uttermost. Our priest king, our, our advocate, expresses the, the pleasure of God to save you to the uttermost, all the way to the end, leaving nothing out to, to cleanse you perfectly from all of your sin, from everything that's wrong. He's willing to save. Now, some of us here might hear that and say, I mean, come on, man. I'm not that bad. Come on, dude. I mean, I I look around at other people in this world, and they're way worse than I am. I am not that bad. Why are you getting so exercised and upset about all this condemnation and justice and all this? I mean, dude, I am not that bad. The truth is, that we are, we are way, way worse than we ever imagined ourselves being. We are wicked, every one of us. We are so wicked that the Son of God had to be crucified for our sin. But the incredible news is that we are far more loved than we ever dare imagine that we would be. That the Son of God 
the living Son of God would be crucified for you and for me. Isn't that encouraging? When we see ourselves for how we really are and the wickedness that is within, the wrong that is within, that the Son of God would die for us. There's nothing better. There may be others of you here who think, nobody could want me like that. If you only knew what I've done, if you only knew what's in my heart, if you only knew how I've lived my life, nobody wants me like that. Oh, friend, you are so precious that the Son of the living God took on flesh and went to the cross for you. There's no one out of the reach of Jesus. There is no one so wicked that the Son of God doesn't say, come to me. All you, all you sinners, come to me. No one out of his reach he saves to the uttermost we have an unstoppable unfailing advocate in heaven because of Jesus you are beloved trust him second quickly he says in verse 25 he always lives to make intercession that's what Jesus is doing for you right now he's praying for you He's not some far off, distant, uncaring God. He sees, he knows, he's praying for you. I hope that encourages you. That Jesus at the right hand of the Father is interceding. He knows what you're going through and he's praying for his strength in your weakness. He's praying for joy in your life. He's praying for you to stand fast in whatever trial you're experiencing. He's praying for you right now. That's what Jesus is is doing for you. He's praying that you would persevere, that you would make it, that when when your strength is gone, that his strength would carry you when you don't have anything left. You look around and you see people who you just think, man, the blows just keep coming in their life. Just one thing right after the other. How are they going? How are they, how are they, how are they standing through this? That's the answer Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for you, our advocate, our intercessor, the one who makes our needs hearable before the throne, our intercessor prays for you. I'll end with this. Tony, my fishing partner, the one who was interested in hearing about this Jesus, who wants to do something about this Jesus who cares about what's wrong in this world, here's where that ended up. He didn't bow his head and pray the sinner's prayer. That's not what happened. But he did tell me that he wanted to believe in this God. This God who was good and cared enough to give himself for a people who aren't good. This God who cared enough to give himself for people who know that something is wrong on the inside and can't find any other way to be made right. He wanted to believe in a God like that. I wonder, do we? Do you? Because that's the kind of advocate that you have before the throne. Do you want him today? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are our advocate, that you are our intercessor. Whom do we have in heaven but you? Because you have the words of life, Lord. Open our eyes that we would see you and behold you and trust you and know that you are good and that you cleanse us. So, oh Lord, give us grace. Give us hearts that believe. Give us lives that are offered to you and help us to trust. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.